In today's Lost Media installment, we're going to be taking a look at all things Gremlins, such as some gruesome deleted scenes, how an ape nearly got involved with the madness, and rounding things off with a little bit of family entertainment. And remember, if this sounds like your type of cup of tea and you want to see more videos just like this one, then be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out. Righty-o, with the context out of the way, let's make a start. The original draft for Gremlins had a lot of bleak and dark gruesome moments that probably would have made the movie a fitting R-rated flick. The scenes reported to be included is a scene where the Gremlins decapitate Billy's mum's head, Gremlins breaking into a McDonald's, where they devour the staff, but leave the fast food untouched. The Gremlins additionally eat the family dog, and Gizmo was meant to turn into Stripe, the main Gremlin leader. Some conflicting sources say that he would have either died at the end, or reverted back to his Mogwai status, with Billy returning Gizmo back to the china shop. But Spielberg saw the film working better as a family flick, and talked to Chris Columbus into rewriting the film within this mindset. So not only the more grisly scenes were reworked out, and to keep Gizmo untransformed and to help in the final act. The original screenplay to the movie is still not publicly accessible to read. Who knows what other major differences may have been from the first draft to the final screenplay. In the early stages, the team were trying to figure out on how they were going to bring the gremlins to life. They were proposing to perhaps use stop motion, but having to animate the creatures frame by frame was going to be extremely time consuming, and they didn't necessarily want to delay the movie any further. They were additionally not too sure on how the realm of life-size puppets would go. Joe Dante then came up with an idea on why not use an ape actor. So they got to work on producing a screen test, providing a prototype costume for the chimpanzee to wear. The ape was not too pleased with wearing the face mask. After careful consideration, the crew concluded that it was not the appropriate way forward for the gremlins. Thus, they put their faith into puppets. As of today, the test shoot of the ape has not been widely shared, but perhaps a good reason it hasn't been featured in a documentary on the making of gremlins was that reportedly the ape was constantly defecating on the set. So perhaps out of good taste, they don't want to show it alongside the working progress of the puppets. Only getting so much of a performance out of the life-size Gizmo animatronic, they built a larger puppet. For many of the close-up shots of Gizmo's face, interestingly, in the French trailer, they use a shot of Gizmo holding the 3D glasses, but overlook the assistant's hand being way smaller than the massive Gizmo puppet. A personal favourite little easter egg of mine from the film is where in the science convention you can see the famous George Powell time machine warming up in the background. And then a few moments later, the machine is gone, with the onlookers confused as to where it could be. The George Powell time machine movie is easily within my top 3 favourite movies of all time, so of course I had to mention it here, <laughs> wink wink. Oh and uh, in the same shot, Spielberg is trolling around in a little vehicle. Now I could easily be distracted naming off another dozen or so easter eggs in the film, but so that we don't get ahead of ourselves, let's return back to our main program, okay? In the movie, there was a scene where the girlfriend Kate relays on how she found out that there was no Santa Claus, where it was after that they found that her father had died by breaking his neck dressed up as Santa Claus while climbing down the chimney. The whole monologue was pressurised by the higher-ups to be removed out, as they thought it was unnecessary and stopped the film. Spielberg and Dante had final say on the last cut. Spielberg wasn't as involved with the final edit, seeing it as Dante's movie, so it was just Joe and the studio going back and forth about the scene. Many members of the production staff were convinced that it wasn't going to make it into the final cut, but Dante got his way in the end. 10 minutes of deleted scenes have made it to the home media market, which appear to be the same discarded scenes as previewed on the leak work print, but there are still some reported scenes that are not available to watch anywhere, with director Joe Dante stating in one of the recent audio commentaries of the film that the initial cut was about 2 hours and 40 minutes long. There's never anything quite as depressing as looking at your first two and a half hour rough cut of a picture because you just think there's so many things wrong with it, how am I ever going to fix it? Joe Dante additionally revealed in the commentary that there were many atmospheric unused shots of Chinatown. Walks through all these streets and there's people burning things, there's all this local colour and stuff, and you just really don't need it. 
Edward Ander played a cut character from the film, being the head of the bank. There are quite a few unreleased scenes with this character. A particular quirk he has is a stopwatch, where it seems like by the click of his device that gets everybody on the move. He would eventually be killed by the gremlins off screen. There is a deleted scene where Billy and Kate come across his body that was shown in the network version, with the exception of this one shot showing his body alongside all the dismantled clocks. In the gruesome kitchen scene, after Billy's mum, Lynn, stabs one of the gremlins, we were meant to see that same stabbed gremlin to pull out the kitchen knife, but deemed to be way too graphic, it was cut out. But in the final movie, you can still see that same gremlin squirming and wiggling in the background. The original death scene for the science teacher, Mr. Hansen, when Billy discovers his body, we were meant to see his face filled to the brim with syringes. But at the reluctance of Spielberg, they had to refilm the scene, where instead now, the doctor has a needle up his anus. In the scene where Billy wakes up and finds his dog Barney wrapped up in Christmas lights, there was meant to be a prior sequence towards this where the evil Mogwai leads the dog outside, concluding by ganging up on him. The set piece would have featured the Mogwais curling up into a ball and bouncing down the stairs, with the dog Barney following along, although a theoretical reason as to why this was cut for the final print were reportedly that the animatronics for this scene were a little bit fidgety. Sneaking past the parents' bedroom and and that and, and, and these things were supposed to look like they were walking. Well, yeah. it didn't look like they were they, walking. They looked like they were walking for about a nanosecond. <laughs> that shot going down, we did like 60 shots in the tank and he kept flipping up and down and upside down and all around. Finally, like at about the 61st take, we got it and then somebody pointed out something to me. We had forgotten Stripes, stripe. I just felt like dirt <laughs> wasn't good. We have to do one more time. In the scene that leads up to Mrs. Daigle's demise on the electric chair, we would have first seen her annoyed and disheveled by some carol singers outside, angrily telling them to go away. Upon returning back inside, she hears the carol singers still going on. Now being extremely unhappy, she returns back outside, finding, to her surprise, a carol of gremlins singing. This scene was trimmed to remove the human carol singers to more or less get straight to the point. It still have yet to have been featured on any home media release or even been shown publicly. The gremlins in the bar only lasted for one page in the script, but in the initial rough cut it lasted for about 10 minutes. The final film cut runs for just about 4 minutes, leaving about 6 minutes worth of content left on the cutting room floor that has never been officially released. Then, at the end of the movie, where Gizmo pulls one of the blinds open, which exposes Stripe to the sunlight, finishing him off, Billy was meant to do the final killing blow, opening the final blind, which marks the end for Stripe. But in the theatrical cut, they removed this heroic scene with Billy, giving the glory instead to Gizmo. What the heck? I thought I was the hero of this movie, and Joe turned to me and he goes, The name of the picture is Gremlins. Not Billy's Adventures in Kingston Falls. It's called Gremlins. So the gremlin is going to save the day. And I went, okay. Since 1968, the United States introduced the age rating, a mark of specification, to allow people to know if a film may be inappropriate for a younger viewer. The setup went as followed, G for general audience, a PG parental guidance, and then an R for viewers that are generally over the age of 15. And then there was the elusive X rating, which meant that only adults can attend the screening. But over time, the type of films that were associated with the X rating tend to follow a similar theme to movies like Deep Throat. And by the time that the home media market had launched, adults would tend to prefer to watch these films in the privacy of their own home. So the X rating would become far less commonplace. And since the MPAA didn't have the foresight to trademark the symbol, and how infamous it was with the adult industry. By 1990, they would replace it with NC-17, with G, PG, and R as the main standards, with PG acting as the middle ground for the other ratings, between family entertainment and the crumbs of mature subject matters. But in 1984, there were two particular movies that had drawn quite a bit of controversy for pushing the envelope of a PG rating. Releasing at the beginning of the summer season was the highly anticipated Indiana Jones sequel, The Temple of Doom, where it featured several graphic scenes. Now nothing so horrendous that it weren't an R rating, but it definitely made a lot of younger viewers feel very uneased. Then a month later, Gremlins premiered, and it garnered a similar lashback 
from concerned parents over the violence in the film. Later that year, when the film was released in the UK during the Christmas season, the BBFC found the violence grossly too much for a PG rating. The board were nearly ready to rate it an 18, but eased it down to a 15 rating. Oh, I can't understand why that should be a 15 certificate. You know, we have a very silly censor in this country. With both Indiana Jones and Gremlins under the responsibility of Steven Spielberg, I can't understand why Steven Spielberg lent his name to it, quite honestly. He advised the MPAA to perhaps introduce a new rating board between PG and R, and in August of the same year, they devised the PG-13 rating which when Gremlins was released in Ireland actually earned a similar rating, with accompanying 12-year-olds allowed to watch the movie. Do you think that film's suitable for under 15-year-olds? Um, if I got a sense of humour, yes. The 12A certificate would eventually be introduced in the UK by 1989, just in time for the Gremlins sequel, The New Batch. And in 2012, the film was re-released in cinemas in the UK, now given a 12A certificate. It's no surprise to anybody that with the filmmaker's ambition to make Gizmo seemingly a cute and sincere character, that the Mogwai and the Gremlin creatures would so easily translate to merchandising potential, and that the marketing department with a hit movie under their belt were going to take full advantage of this, with toys, books, audio productions, and food product placement. When the sequel Gremlins 2 was beginning to take shape, an animated series was within the works. Not much is entirely known about the show. All we do know is that it was given the working title, Gizmo and the Gremlins, and that only one episode was produced, the pilot. Although the pilot may have never been fully completed, according to director Joe Dante, the show was incomplete, due to Gremlins 2 not quite being as successful as originally hoped for. Aside from being mentioned in a Bugs Bunny magazine in 1990, nothing else has ever resurfaced of the pilot's existence. No video, no screenshot, no concept art, nothing virtually at all. Perhaps hopefully coinciding with the release of the prequel series, Gizmo, Secret of the Mogwai, it could maybe perhaps inspire a lost media search that will hopefully give us some answers on the original Lost Gremlins show. While the franchise potential of Gremlins may have been cut short, the window for seeking out new potentials to do with the Gremlin property just lasted long enough for there to be a Gremlins theme park attraction titled The Great Gremlins Adventure, debuting and launching with the Australian park, the Warner Brothers Movie World, where it starts with the guests entering a theatre, watching Warner Bros bloopers, before the Gremlins break into the projection room, thus forcing the guests to evacuate on the dark ride, where you travel through the Warner Brothers archive, infested to the brim with Gremlins but you're later accompanied with Beetlejuice aiding in your journey while you're trying to evade the Gremlins. In 1996, a duplicate of the ride would open in Warner Brothers Movie World Germany, but instead of Beetlejuice, it would be Alf that would help you along your journey. Alf was additionally featured in the pre-show, with the crossover being complete with him being attacked by the Gremlins. Both attractions would be closed by the early 2000s. As always with theme park attractions, the exclusive footage of ALF only survives thanks to a home cam recording of the guest visit. The clean footage is likely still locked away in a Warner Brothers archive, 